Hello and welcome to paramedicine.com. Translating research into practice. And welcome to episode number two, the primary survey. I'm Mark Kolbeck in Queensland, Australia. And I'm Sonia Maria in New South Wales, Australia. So this episode, what we're gonna be focusing on is the primary survey that paramedics do when they're first approaching a patient. Usually I say that this is about the first one to five minutes as somebody is walking in towards the patient and doing a very quick check to make sure that everything's okay. We're gonna be basing this on our paper. Yay! Yay! <laughs> this is published in the Irish Journal of Paramedicine. It's up on the internet now, so go to the IJP and you'll be able to see it there. And um, Sonia and I were both involved, we're authors in this, and there was a group of other people that were involved as well. So aside from Sonia and I, we also had uh, uh, Georgette Eaton, who's in Oxford, England, who is a UK paramedic and uh, educator as well. And we had, I'm just taking a look so I make sure I don't forget anybody, we had Craig Campbell at University of Tasmania, who did an awful lot of work on the final editing of this, along with you, Sonia. And uh, he's a paramedic, paramedic educator as well, uh, also involved in writing clinical practice guidelines as I have been, as you have been, right? Yeah, okay. And then we had Alan Batt in Canada from Fanshawe College. Alan is the editor of the IJP, but there was a, a very, hand, one of my students asked, isn't that conflict of interest, putting it in your own? And I said, no, because we weren't involved in the peer review or anything like that. We handed it over to other people. Um, so Alan's the editor of the IJP, and I guess I should declare conflict of interest. I'm on the editorial board of IJP. Um, and Alan is originally an Irish paramedic, and he's now working and teaching in Canada. And then our last person who was involved is Matt, Matthew Caffey, who previously was here in Australia. He was senior lecturer in charge of the Masters in Paramedicine at CQU, I think. But then he's left and he's gone back to the United States. He's working now. He's a physician's assistant as well. And he's working in the Loma Linda University Medical Center in California and gradually sort of shifting off into neurology, which is too bad because he was great to work with, but he's kind of moving this, leaving this behind a little bit. But he did a lot of work on the paper. The whole group did a lot of work and it was a lot of fun to work with them. We called ourselves the International Paramedic Authors Group. Well, I called us that. I tag. <laughs> I tag. That's right. And I really hope that we get to work together again because this was a great paper. Um, Sonia, why don't you tell us a little bit about what was involved and how the project laid out and how we developed this paper and how long it took and all of that stuff. Mm, okay. So um, if you have listened to our first podcast, you'll know that uh, Mark and I are putting together the Australasian CPGs, which is a group of clinical practice guidelines and this is the one of the first ones that we're doing the primary survey um, obviously you know that the secondary survey comes after this one that'll be probably our next one next but, show <laughs> next show to put this together what we did was we used a process called the Delphi Delphi method where we gather a group of experts together well we consider ourselves all experts and obviously um, we, we spent a lot of time in, in making sure that the group was good to put together yeah. as well um, so if you look at the background of the group, all of us have been involved in the development of clinical practice guidelines. And what we did is we got together um, all of the relevant guidelines that ambulance officers use or paramedics use. And we looked, we were trying to find where is it mentioned about primary survey and secondary survey. We did at the same time, actually, but this specifically is about primary survey today. So after going through all of the different services and all of their literature about um, primary or secondary survey, if it was in there, we then um, went, uh, we all put down the, what, we all put down the information that was in there yeah. from the different services. So basically we got given um, a task each to go through the different services and collect the information from them that was about the primary survey within those documents. From and when we did that, we did that with the CPGs, but we also did it from their like uh, clinical management. instructions, skills That's manuals right. and procedures. Yeah, procedures. And yeah. Anything that we could find that Correct. referred to what was included in the primary or secondary. We yes, because a lot of that yeah. documentation over time has been taken out of the actual full full volume of the clinical practice guidelines. And quite often now, ambulance services will have a separate skills manual 
or something mm-hmm. on their, you know, their inter- internet site, which is, you know, a different document. So where we could, we gathered both documents together, the actual practice guidelines or the protocols and also the maintenance documents as well, the skills documents as well. Mm-hmm. So after collating them all together, we then basically put together a, a massive document of, you know, more than 100 different items that was in there. And yeah, then the debate started, the, the Delphi process of, That's you know, right. of validating and quantifying what went where and what, what should stay and looking at the actual flow processes about, you know, the systematic method of the primary survey. And we know that over so, time it's changed, so don't we, to, to go from... Yeah, some have. Yeah. yeah. Which, which uh, locations did we choose to include? We should talk about that. So all of the Australasian services, so Australia and New Zealand, as well yeah. as Ireland, UK, um, South Africa, Qatar. Yep. What am I missing? The United Arab Emirates we did as well. Yeah. And we chose those UAE. because they were all, except for the Australasian ones, which obviously was our focus, we chose those other ones because they were all national. So the Republic of Irish, the Republic of Irish. That one's going to kill me. (laughs) The UK. Uh, I wanted to do Canada as well, but there's no national ones. Oh, there's also the National National Exemplar CPGs that was written by a group of physicians in the United States, which are really good evidence-based ones. But as far as I know, no one's actually using. It's like a a template for people to refer to, but they're really really good. Once we get the website up, we'll post links because most Mm -hmm. of those are available online. I don't think the UAE and Qatar ones are in the Middle East, mm. but the rest are. So we'll, we'll get them up there. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So those are the ones we did. So once we got them all together and they're collated and we, we started working through the Delphi process, this is the part that took a long time. So getting that um, expert <laughs> opinion and agreement, trying to validate it where possible with evidence base and having those many discussions. And that's why it took us such a long time to end up with that final document. And, and as you know, most listeners who are listening to this, that things have changed along the way too. So the emphasis for putting circulation first before um, ABCs and cardiac arrest, etc. And we had to kind of take a lot of that information into, um, into context as well. So when we're considering whether it was trauma or medical. So the document that we ended up putting together is a document that can be used for any situation. And obviously... As we go through and have a chat about it, you'll see that it needs to be tailored to the situation as well. So not every item within it is going to be relevant in context to, you know, the situation that you're going into. Yeah, right, right. Mm. And how long did it take us? Two years, eighteen months, yeah, two years, year, something year and like half, that. Two years, something like that. And was it multiple 15, iterations. 15, yeah, I was about to say fifteen iterations. <laughs> I think we did. And if you take a look back at the first one that we started with, it was very different. Because this is based mm. on a way that I've been teaching the primary survey for a while. And when I started, I had the um, initial, like the primary ABCDs and the secondary ABCDs. And then we decided, nah, that's too confusing. Let's, let's not actually mm. do it that way. So yeah, a lot of thought went into the document. And what I think is interesting is that it's not really just um, a regurgitation of what we saw in all the other ones. We took that information and we used that as our basic template. But then we, we added stuff and we made it work in the context. I mean, we've all been teaching the primary survey for 10, 15 years. So making it work in a way that seemed organized to us, not only as clinical paramedics, but also as experienced educators. Mm, correct. And also in the sense that it can be used as a handover tool as well, some of those elements from it. So we were thinking about... Um, other uses and and also potentially for other practitioners as well, not just potentially paramedics, eh? Yeah. And, you know, I think, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Craig who said, you know, there's some stuff that we throw in the primary survey, which nobody ever includes in the primary survey. And we started to have a talk about that. And we talked about, you know, some of the things we'll talk about under bang, zap, push. But that to me um, showed that this was more than just a, an accumulation of what existed out there. I think we did some synthesis as well mm. and turned Absolutely. it into something that I think is better. And now this, this um, in the paper, we call it the International Paramedic Primary and Secondary Survey. Um, it's starting to get used. I think they're using it in Coventry. I know Alan's starting to use it at Fanshawe. Craig's using it at University of Tasmania in Sydney. 
We're using it in every unit in our degree now in uh, ACU in Brisbane. So all of our sessional scholars. Yeah, the post that's right. presentations. Yeah. That's mm. right. And part of what we'll be doing, and this is a part of the AP CPGs, the Australasian Paramedic CPG project, is uh, writing scenarios. And all of our scenarios will be formatted in this format for the primary and then with the next show, the secondary survey. So it's starting to get spread and we're going to be developing resources built on this, which I think is kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking with some people now who are going to be like our scenario masters for paramedicine.com and help us develop scenarios, very experienced nurses and paramedics, like dual trained, um, who will be looking them over and making sure everything's right. Good. So yeah, it's kind of exciting. Absolutely. All right, Mark. So let's, let's get into it. Um, how about you take us through the, concept of safety first get okay so probably the first first thing to do is to say we we realized as we uh look through all the <clears> topics <throat> that there were about 50 things that you roughly depending on how you count it 50 things that people have to memorize in order unerringly without omission under high stress circumstances and we thought if we just make a list of 50 things nobody's going to forget it so using the idea of, you know, clumping, we thought, how can we get some major headings that are going to be easy to remember as a mnemonic or an initialism that people could, could keep in their head and not have to look at in, when they're out working clinically. So we came up with the mnemonic, safety first, get A, B, C, D, E's, which all on its own makes sense. You know, if you're going to approach that patient. What do you want to do? Well, safety first, then I'll get my A, B, C, D, E's. So that hmm. sentence alone actually works and then as you deconstruct that it's kind of like a chapter you know those are each of the headings in the chapters and then there are subheadings under each thing so let's start with that safety first get uh, which actually expands dramatically there's so much in there we'll probably end up talking about this for 10 minutes so the first thing is safety and safety is its own word the rest are all initials so safety stands for as you're driving to the call, put on your goggles, put on your gloves, and make sure that you have personal protective equipment against body substances. So, you know, infectious diseases are always an issue. We never know what we're walking into. So gloves and goggles and whatever else you need. If you're going to a motor vehicle accident, uh, you might put on your hard hat or your leather gloves or whatever other safety equipment is appropriate. But just get yourself ready from that safety point of view of protecting yourself from whatever environment you're going into. Mostly gloves and goggles. Mm -hmm. That's what we're thinking about on the way to the call. Now, the ambulance arrives, we get out, we start walking towards the scene. And as we're walking towards our patient, uh, we start thinking F-I-R-S-T. So that's safety, F-I-R-S-T. And each letter stands for something. So the F is fear. And if you walk in and your spidey sense starts tingling and you think there's something to fear, then you need to pay attention to that. If the scene is not safe, don't go in. Okay, so that's the first. Uh, so there's a lot of safety elements in here because dangerous job. So safety F. The I stands for incident. And as you're walking in, you're trying to make a rough a rough estimation in your mind of what sort of incident am I walking into? Is it somebody at the bottom of a ladder? Or at the bottom of a building, mm -hmm. or is this somebody clutching their chest or in tripod and position? Short where it's not always what we what we're called to, is it? <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> right. You get called for an elderly patient fell on the yeah. floor, and you actually get there. It's a dolphin like with an arrow in it. <laughs> That's right. You're, you're you're taking a broad look at what the incident is and trying to get a rough idea of what could happen. And the if you want to break it down roughly, we're really thinking about two major categories, which are medical or trauma. Is this a medical incident or is it a traumatic incident? And if it is medical incident, then we're trying to think about the nature of the illness. And you can see stuff like that when when you're walking in. You know, the, the tripoding asthmatic, can't breathe. <laughs> or, um, you know, somebody who's just like, oh, oh my chest it feels like something's sitting on. You know, just get a rough idea. Or they're obtunded and they're not tracking you as you walk in. They're just, you know, that's the nature of illness. And then mechanism of injury. Like I said, are they at the bottom of a ladder? Are they under a, a balcony that they've jumped off of? Have they been hit by a car? Are they in a car? How fast was the car going? Just you're starting to get all of these sort of clues around you. You're not making any conclusions yet, but you're just thinking about the incident. Hmm. So safety, is there any fear? 
what's the incident I'm walking into? And then the R, to be honest, the R doesn't quite fit. It's number, <laughs> with the emphasis on the R, of patients. How many people am I actually caring for? So if there's one person sitting on the couch, then that's the person I'm probably dealing with. But if you're at a, a bus stop and somebody's been run over, or a few people have been run over, and there's people standing watching who are in shock, you've suddenly got a lot more patience. If you pull up to a car and there's uh, you know, a parent in the front and a car seat in the back and lots of you know, baby paraphernalia, where's the baby? Did it get thrown? You know, like, let's just make sure before I tunnel in on this one person that there isn't somebody else in the bushes or in another room that I'm not thinking of. Mm -hmm. Safety, fear, incident number, S is send for help because there's lots of other people who help us do our job. If the scene is unsafe, we'll be calling for police. If there's a, maybe an obese patient, we're going to be calling for backup carrying. If there's live wires, we're going to be calling hydro, electrical crews. If there's a, a dog, we're going to be calling, you know, uh, animal control. There's lots of other people that we might think of asking for help. The big one is, you know, patient assaulted. Okay, thanks. Where's the assailant? We don't know. Okay, are the police coming? Yes, they are. Okay, are they on scene? You know, that sort of a thing. Making mm -hmm. sure that we're sending for help if we need it. If you're uh, a paramedic with a higher level of paramedic working in your system and you're hearing a very acutely ill patient, maybe I need to get these higher level paramedics coming in to help us as well. Yeah. So, like, you know, in Australia, we would say if you're an advanced care paramedic, you need an intensive or critical care paramedic. If you're in the mm -hmm. States, if you're an EMT, call for an NREMTP, that yeah. sort of a thing. Mark, would that be the point to that if it was a uh, an accident on the road that you might, you know, request the fireys or the police or extra people to come and secure the scene if necessary? Yeah, absolutely. If you know that you're going to be working on the road, um, you don't want to have to be making sure that cars aren't hitting you or your team, right? You want to make sure you're uh, properly protected. Or if there's extrication and your service doesn't do extrication, if it's the fires, fireys, as you guys say, or we have SES here, right? Yeah. And what does that stand for? Because I know they're like emergency help, but... State Emergency Services. State Emergency Services. Okay. Yeah. And they do a lot of the rescue stuff. Correct. Yeah. So you might be calling in SES. Know, know who your people are. I'd rather be a helper asking for help than a rescuer asking to be rescued. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is the basic rule yeah. there for sending for help. And then uh, we've gone safety first. Uh, and then the T actually stands for two things. If you've got a patient who look like the, they've had a mechanism of injury suggesting trauma, then we're going to worry about the neck, the mm -hmm. C-spine. So trauma to the C-spine because we don't want people moving their heads around. So at this point, we might actually be saying to the person at the bottom of the ladder who's twisted up, Hi, my name is Mark. I'm a paramedic. I'm approaching you. Please don't move your head as I approach. I don't want you to move your neck. Okay, and we'll go and we'll immobilize their head to make sure they're not moving their neck. So if it's trauma, we're worried in particular about that cervical spine, the C-spine, making sure that it's safe. Um, if it's not trauma, or if it is trauma and there's a lot of people, then we switch from dealing with our one patient to doing triage, which is French for sorting, triage. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be taking a look, not at the one person, but switching gears and going, okay, there's a lot of people here who's very sick, who's a little bit sick, who's not sick, and who's dead. And mm -hmm. let's just identify them as the other rescuers come in. Mm -hmm. So safety first, the T stands for either trauma to the C-spine or triage if you've got a large group of people. Mm -hmm. So safety first, that's easy as you walk in. And then we switch to the next word, which is get. And G-E-T each stands for something as well. So we're going to ask about the general impression of our patient. Or if it's multiple patients, if it's a large incident, again, we're going to switch to that sort of triage mind state. And what's the general impression of this disaster, of this major incident? So if I were to describe to somebody um, what a patient looked like, I could do it poorly and say something like, oh, yeah, we're with the patient here and they're, uh, you know, they're really sick and I think I need some more help. And the person on the other end of the line is going to be, not very capable of making a mental image of what's going on with that. So they're going to say, you know, how old's the patient? Where are they? What, you know, 
give me more of, a, of an image. So when we describe what our patient is looking like, if we're calling for backup, or in scenarios, if you're a student walking in and we say, okay, so what have you got? We look for a general sequence of how people approach it, and we'll say something like 25-year-old um, male um, sitting in tripod position in his living room in moderate distress. And that gives you an idea. Or, you know, 62-year-old female found prone on the road beside her overturned vehicle in severe distress. Okay, how old are they? What's their gender? Um, the position they're found in, the general location they are. It makes a difference if you're, you know, on a boat or in the living room. Um, and roughly their level of distress. And level of distress is easy. If they, you walk in, they're talking in there, okay, you say, no apparent distress. If they look like they're absolutely dying, that's severe distress. And if they're just going, oh, I'm kind of sick, that's moderate distress. Very broad categories, okay? So our general impression of the patient, if it's a large incident, then we're going to switch to um, giving an update saying this is what the incident is, and that's the methane report. And I haven't taught trauma for a while, so I don't actually remember what the methane is. Do you remember methane? I've got it written down. Well, it's interesting because we use ethane, which is similar, yes. but without the, okay. the, I'm not actually sure what the M is. So Well, the M, M is you're declaring a major disaster. Right. So you say, hi, this is Mark Holbeck. I'm arriving at the scene. I see seven overturned cars, multiple patients. I'm declaring this a major disaster or a major incident or multi-casualty incident. Something starts with M. That your, that your jurisdiction knows means, uh-oh, this is a big one. And then E is, got it written down, exact location. Yeah. So how to get people there. Um, and... T is the type of incident it is. A is access and egress. So how do you want the vehicles to come in? How do you want them to get out? Because you can really get jammed up. If everybody's driving in from all different directions and they all sort of double park each other, you can't get out. So the first person in is the one who gives the methane report or ethane report and says, I want everybody to come in from the west road and then leave via the east road so that we've got you know a clear way to do it. Um, N is numbers of patients, and then E is the emergency services yeah, uh, that are there already yeah. or the ones that are required. So, yeah. you know, emergency yeah. services, it's just me on my bicycle. <laughs> Send yeah. everybody. We might know that also as a sit rep. Um, so, yeah, that's what they I know call in a lot here. of yeah, situation report, basically, the ethane or methane is, you know, the same as what a, a sit rep is for when I was first introduced to the paramedicine services, but that's what we used to call that, isn't it? Right, mm. yeah. And that's mm. really, again, for students, showing that you have an understanding of what's going on, you can quickly summarize what's happening to yeah. the person who's evaluating you in the scenario. Or when you're a working paramedic, being able to say, I need the next level paramedics because I've got, and then you do those five major points. Or saying, mm. this is a major disaster, multi-casualty incident, Let's the, this is how yeah. I need to organize. Yeah. So that's safety, F-I-R-S-T, general impression, mm -hmm. which we give a report. Um, and then for the first time, after all of this talking, you're actually engaging with the patient. Up to now, we haven't even spoken to them, really. We're just doing this. This is all gone very quick, this. though. Have a, you know, this initial start, you know, it's probably only 30 seconds to a minute. depends on, on how much if. activity is happening. Yeah, um, it could just be, if you're not giving the general report to somebody else, it could just mm -hmm. be what you do as you walk towards the patient. Yeah. And it's remarkable when we examined it, when we realized just how much thinking we do in a formalized way in those maybe five seconds walking towards mm -hmm. a patient because we haven't even touched them or spoken to them yet. No. And we've done safety. We've done, is there anything to be fear of? We've looked at the incident. We've looked at the number. We've thought about sending for help. We've thought about trauma to the C-spine. We've thought, thought about triage. We've got a general impression of what's going on. And now I can say, hi, my name's Mark. I'm a paramedic. How can I help you today? Mm -hmm. We've done all of that. Mm -hmm. So the next one, so we've done G, general impression. Next one is E, and it stands for estimate their levels of awareness or levels of consciousness, some people say. I like saying awareness. Um, and what we do usually is we talk to the patient and say, hi, how are you? My name's Mark. And one of the things I teach my students to look for is tracking. So if you walk in 
they'll have heard the siren coming and they'll, you know, hear the bustle as we come up the stairs or whatever. Have they walk bag in. ready? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got the fancy uniforms on, we've got all the equipment. And if you walk in and they're kind of looking away, that's very atypical. So usually when you walk in, they funk, they lock on you and they track with your eyes as you walk in. And that's an immediate clue. So my patient or my patients, my students here, uh, always say, are they tracking me? And I say, as you find it, and they say, okay, unless it's a mannequin. And they say, yes, mm -hmm. they are. So are they tracking me is the first thing they ask. And then they introduce themselves and they say, how can I help? Hmm. And what we use then is the pretty much international standard AVPU. Mm -hmm. So is the patient alert? Are they responding to verbal? Uh, so alert I'm... for us is tracking. And yeah. then P is pain. Are they responding to pain? And if so, how? And we'll go on to AVPU a lot more when we get into assessments. Mm -hmm. And then U is unresponsive. So we've gone, yeah. we've, sir, can you hear me? Ma'am, ma open your eyes. No response. We've been really loud. Uh, we've administered pain. There's no response. That's unresponsive. Mm -hmm. So we're estimating the levels of awareness. And if they... If they're not speaking to us, we might use the motor score of the Glasgow Coma score to see what their response is to pain, just to give us a rough idea and to remember later if it's getting better or worse, it's establishing our trend, right? So safety, F-I-R-S-T, general impression, estimate levels of awareness, again, by saying hello. And then before we get into the ABCDs and before we really put our head down and, and get into this, you know, closer view, microscopic view, we stay macro and we say, are there any threats? Are there any threats to me or my partner or anybody else on the team or to the patient? Uh, and it could be, we talk about Pope, people, object, places, and environment. There's mm -hmm. lots of different things that could be a threat. But at this point, one of the things that we put in is life-threatening hemorrhage. So if we walk in and there's, you know, the power cord arcing around, oop, I'm not going in there. If we go in and they're in a huge puddle of big red blood, we want to know where the blood's coming from. If if there's if we're on the road and traffic hasn't been secured and we've said hello, don't move. We're waiting to make sure that the cars are guided around us so that nobody gets hit. We're just before we focus in, we're looking to make sure that we're all safe and there's no threats. And like you said, when we presented this paper, a lot of the comments that we get got came back saying you haven't spoken about what was the term that they used catastrophic Cat we didn't say catastrophic bleeding we said mm -hmm. life-threatening bleeding but we didn't say catastrophic and some people were perturbed mm -hmm. by that so mm -hmm. i think we'll probably change it so that we have the word catastrophic in there so people are oh i think it's just a, it's a state or a province or a regional uh word that's used it's certainly not mm -hmm. catastrophic is not um, it's not used everywhere, so that it's just a terminology that people get ingrained into them because it was such a big yeah. change where we went yeah. from ABC, we went to CAB, you know. So That's right, the small C and then the yeah. ABCs. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I think actually life-threatening is, is a broader term that is probably more descriptive, but It's that's more understandable. That can, so what is catastrophic? You know, what, what is yeah. the definition of it? Whereas most people would understand a, a hemorrhage that is life-threatening. Life-threatening. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so at that point, we're going to switch over from the safety first get, or safety first get, and we're going to move into the ABCDEs. So, Sonia, why don't you take the lead on this and tell us a little bit about how we approach this differently, and then we'll go through the pieces. Okay. So I'm sure most of our listeners are aware of the ABCs and what they are, ABCDEs, the, the more traditional sense of, of the terminology. Um, these are these are usually performed in order, you know, of priority, so airway, over-breathing, over-circulation, etc. We understand that people quite often will do these together in some cases. They'll be checking the airway and then they'll do breathing and circulation together as well so mm -hmm. just a, but but um i don't know what you teach up there mark as far as um the ordering of this specifically where the students are allowed to check breathing and circulation together is this something that you're yeah with? we do that and i actually yeah. encourage them to do that um yeah but again to think critically about what they're finding and make decisions based on what they found but it's good yeah. to break it down in order when you're learning it 
It is absolutely, and this is the, you know the best way of learning it is in a, in an order, and we use the find it, fix it, and then move on approach as well. So when you find a problem, so say the airway is obstructed, you'd need to clear it before then you moved on to breathing and circulation, etc. So if you have a look through our document, you'll see that for each of these, airway, breathing, circulation, and disability, etc., there's little things uh, on the side there to consider as you're moving through from one to the next. So with our airway, we are considering whether it's uh, open and it's clear or it's patent. Does it need any cleaning or suctioning? Um, are there any impending or obstructive difficulties? So is there snoring in the back of the throat that with positioning at this point we can't clear it and make it uh, sound better before moving on to breathing. So while you're listening and looking into the airway, you're um, considering the things like positioning and suctioning, foreign body. Are you going to need to put in an OPA way at this point? Or, um, you know, are they going to be okay while you're moving on to the breathing and circulation? So always mm. in the back of your mind, these things are sort of happening, aren't they? And we, we realize that some of that is, um, you know, some of it is taking place simultaneously as well. Yeah, so we broke it down into assess and then consider, right? Correct. So we're doing our yeah. assessment, and then you're considering. You don't have to, but you're considering. Yes. What other right. adjuncts could we use? Yeah, and there's no reason that um, while you're considering, you're not, you know, um, you know, working out getting the bags in the right positioning, and there's other things that are happening, isn't there, with the people yeah. that are around in your area that. You might, you know, might call out, grab me an OP airway while I'm on to the next step, you know, like, so these yeah. things are sort of, you know, happening at the same time. So breathing, breathing, your look, listening and feeling, nothing new there. We all learned that. Learned that. Um, consider a rapid four point auscultation. So that's quite often we see that in training these days that they'll be not only um, looking, listening for breathing, but they'll actually auscultate for the breathing at the same time. Only four points. That's, it needs to be quick and, and choppy. Um, you'd also consider your oxygen saturations at that point. So really, it, for me, I'm probably looking more at things like, is there any signs of obvious cyanosis on the face and the skin when I'm actually doing mm -hmm. my breathing assessment? Mm -hmm. Circulation, oh, well, back well, to you know, the before consideration. We, yeah, before we go on from breathing, one of the things that I, I like to teach my students, and I think it's a really useful, again, establishing that baseline, is getting yeah. uh, room air SpO2. Yeah. So as they're talking to people, I encourage them to make it automatic to just put the sat on. And most people have seen these now. Most people like reach up their finger. They know exactly what you're doing, but it yeah. gives you that baseline oxygen saturation. So we don't inadvertently push people into hyperoxia, which we're really trying to avoid now. Correct. And, you know, if you've got a good partner who's working with you, they'll be grabbing the gear out for you at the same time and handing you the pulse oximeter. It's, a, it's one of those things that you, the first things that you do when you walk in the room, isn't it? <laughs> After you introduce work. yourself. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, okay, so considering that um, if the patient is really quite critical, that at this point you're probably looking at using, um, assisting their breathing, maybe ventilating them too. So, you know, always your considerations around, you know, bringing out a bag mask and um, having to ventilate the patient. And also in this, uh, the considerations is chest needle decompression as well. So mm -hmm. at this point, there's if they're not uh, moving air and the chest is not rising and falling and you're thinking that they could have a, a um, pneumothorax or a tension pneumothorax, you would need to fix that before moving on because there's Cause no it's point. breathing. Yeah, yeah, it's prohibitive, yeah. Right, so getting on to circulation. Um, the obvious is, is there circulation or not? Is there an, a pulse and how does it feel? What's its strength like? Is it regular? Does it feel like it's bounding? Or is there anything that's glaringly, obviously, um, wrong with it at this point? And we also have another point in there about um, the skin color. So looking at the skin and the perfusion of the skin at that point too. So temperature, any signs, obvious of signs of diaphoresis. You know, our, our students actually talk about this because we talk about perfusion assessment, like getting a rough idea if it's good enough. And a rough rule that I say is take a radial pulse. And if they've got a radial pulse, if the blood's getting to their wrist, it's probably getting to their brain and their heart and their kidneys and their lungs. And it that's all we be. really worry yeah. about right now, you know? Correct. So if you've yeah. got a radial pulse and you can feel it, it's probably good enough for now because it's just a quick check. Yeah. And if it was an unconscious person on the leg, on the on the floor, the only thing I would say is it's more likely to be a carotid pulse, isn't it? If, it, if you're thinking cardiac yeah. arrest, 
yeah. you're thinking carotid, but if it's a person who's sitting there talking to you, then taking a palpate and pulse of the wrist is going to tell you a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so some considerations at this point and um, CPR is the obvious one. If there's yeah. no heartbeat, <laughs> you're going to start doing Make it. One. <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing too, keeping in the back of your mind about, you know, putting in an IV to boost that mm -hmm. circulation. So, mm -hmm. you know, if um, if you think it's going to be needed early, you might be asking your partner to set up a, an IV kit for you or getting some bits out of the, the kit at this point. But um, not necessarily before you finish the primary survey, if it's not critical, but, you know, these are the considerations and the things that you're thinking about. Also, obviously, um, the ECG circulation being a part yeah. of that as well. Yeah. yeah. If you've got time, because sometimes that can be time consuming. And if you think, wow, they look really bad, we'll get to it. But again, consider. Yeah. 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 All right. So moving on to disability. And this yeah. is that. That, fa that famous bang zap push that we put in there. So there's a story behind this because we were talking about all the different things that were going on and sometimes I can't sleep and I was thinking there's got to be a mnemonic or something in here that would work and I think I sent you guys an email at three in the morning and Georgette was the only person who was awake I said I've got it this is <laughs> this is my idea and everyone went yeah that could work <laughs> so we came up with the bang zap push. Yeah, we love the bang zap push, and it and yeah, really it makes cool. sense. It's it, and if you can actually um, memorize little things like the, the what are they called, the mnemonics or the yeah, it, I, what did you call it before the italic? Uh, the initialize. That's initialism. It, yeah, initialism. yeah, initialism. That's the one that I get confused between the two. What is it? You know, but, yeah, um, mnemonic makes a word. I think like radar. Uh, no, that's an acronym. That's an acronym. Yes, radar is an acronym. And then a mnemonic is a general term for any sort of memory device. And then something like mm. A, B, C, D, E would be an initialism. It happens to be right. in alphabetic order. But FBI is an initialism. Yeah. You know, CIA, yeah. those sorts of things. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So disability, bangs out, push. It's going to make you famous, Mark. <laughs> Benzodiazepines. Okay. B for, be for benzos. A for adrenaline. N for naloxone, G for glucose, zap would be electricity, defibbing, and push is pushing any IVs in fluids, so suspected hypovolemia or hypotension. Yeah, yeah. And, and so where this kind of came from was if, I think it was, again, I think it was Craig who said, if I walk in and I see somebody seeing, seizing, at this point I'm going to start thinking about, you know, midazolam, I'm going to start thinking mm. about a benzodiazepine. Mm. Um, if, if they say, you know, I was flung by a bee and they're all, you know, yeah. anaphylactic. Yeah. yeah, we're just going to grab the adrenaline. So it's a, yeah, I think it's a really useful mnemonic. I had a friend of mine here that I teach with, Dale Gorey. He's a um, perfect name for a trauma nurse, Gorey. So yeah. Dale is, <laughs> Dale's a trauma nurse and a paramedic. And he said, you know, with the bang zap push, along with, the uh, benzos for seizure you could also use you could use it as a reminder benzos for the agitated combative patient yeah. that you might want to sedate now here in uh, queensland we use draperidol there's lots of different agents you know you can whatever you want to do use to sedate somebody who's aggressive but that's a that's a useful thing to uh, keep in mind as well so seizing yeah uh mm. benzos, yeah. adrenaline naloxone adrenaline. glucose glucose yeah I guess it's all the things that could cause unconsciousness at that point, isn't it, too, when you're thinking about it? So, yeah. You know, yeah. You or life threat. Glycemic and, yeah, life threatening, absolutely. And with um, the zap. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, just, yeah, zap, obviously, defib, isn't it? Yeah. It's defib, but you know, there's also, you walk in, you turn it on, and someone's barely conscious in like an idioventricular, I'm going to pace yeah. them. Yeah. Somebody walks in and they're, you know, all altered mental status and they're in an SVT at 220, I'm going to cardiac. Yeah. Yeah, so correct. all the electrical things we can do with a monitor, depending on your scope of practice, obviously, is a part of the zap. And then yeah, push there's the all the, I like to think of this as like the bang zap pushes all the critical interventions that need to be done early, quickly. You know, obviously right. we've, we've already handled a couple of those previously, like chest decompression and controlling catastrophic bleeding before yeah, this yeah. point you know those things we had to fix before we got to here 
But other stuff, like at this point, these are critical interventions that need to happen earlier rather than later. Yeah, and one that we missed in the airway would be a surgical airway for the can't intubate, can't ventilate patient. So if that's within your scope of practice and you're attempting yeah. to ventilate, you can't do it. You try to get a tube, it's all gone. I'm going to have to go through the cricothyroid membrane. I'm going to have to get in the trachea that way and establish mm -hmm. an airway surgically. So that would be yeah. one of the... It, it bangs that under push obstruction. blow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. But if, if, but if we're thinking the find it, fix it, move on approach in airway, if it is obstructed or we can't clear it, we would be considering the surgical airway in that, in that consideration, yeah. aren't we? Up there. Yeah. Yeah. It would, it would come sooner. Yeah. And just clarifying about catastrophic life-threatening hemorrhage, that it needs to go up early before a lot of this stuff happening. It's happening too. I know that we've got it in our considerations later on, but, you know, just yeah. reiterating that it does go up a lot earlier. So at that point too, with the disability, we're assessing for any signs of um, obvious trauma, broken bones, you know, facial injuries, things are going to end up being a problem for us as well or might end up making a difference to the way that we have to then manage the patient significantly. Yeah, if they're major, if they're major life threats, right? Like yeah. bilateral yeah. broken femurs or flail chest segment or something. Not necessarily yeah. a sprained ankle, but like the yeah. life-threatening stuff up front. Yeah, significant. And also, you know, signs of obvious um, bleeding or pneumothoraces or pneumothorax starting, et cetera, as well. Yeah. All right, so moving on to E, extrication. Right. So we want to assess our current environmental condition. So is it pouring down with rain? Do we have a, an issue with uh, having to get across the stream to extricate the patient? All of these things mm -hmm. have happened, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They do happen. You know, oh, yeah. Um, having worked in Canada and in the Middle oh, East, how cold is it? How hot is it? You can get second-degree <laughs> burns from the road in the Middle East. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> do I have to move the patient? Yeah. So think about, uh, you know, your egress and, and your access and, and then your egress, you know, how are you going to get out of there with the patient, you know, this is in the, and you've got to remember all of this primary survey stuff, it's right at the beginning. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at and you've done your assessment of this patient, you get to this point of E and now you've got to consider how, how, how well is my patient? Am I going to be able to get them up and to get them out or are we going to need a Stokes stretcher? You know, do mm -hmm. I need... You know, looking at the way that we're now going to be exiting and leaving, um, you need to pay, pay consideration to that earlier on rather than later because you might need some additional services or assistance to actually help you get out with that yeah. patient comfortably. Bear chairs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Exactly. So like, you walk so up the stairs and they're up there. Yeah. yeah and, you know, the there's, the, there's the consideration here too about um, – that, you know, the famous saying of load and go. And I, I like to think of that as um, not so much loading, loading and going, but treating en route because there's, a, mm -hmm. I think, a way of thinking about when we load and go that we're not doing anything, but you actually mm -hmm. are, aren't you? you you're going yeah. early, but you're still doing stuff, aren't you? You're treating it as you go. Be. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you need to get out of there early, then this is the time that you're making your decision to do that because your patient may not be okay enough to hang around for any length of time on the scene. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we might be thinking too at that point, or we should be thinking too, of how am I going to get them to definitive care? That's what we're doing. Sometimes we don't take people. But if we mm. do, do uh, like are we? F I remember once working in Toronto and we had somebody having a stroke in their home and it was the middle of rush hour and the hospitals were far away there's just no way we were going to get that person to the hospital in a quick amount of time and we just said is the helicopter available and yeah. they landed down the street and we met them and they they were in the hospital in 10 minutes it would have taken yeah. us 40 you know and you might not think of that in the middle of a large urban center but mm -hmm. it's those are things to think about if somebody's entrapped getting uh if you can't run blood getting a team in that can you know, doing advanced stuff like that. Yep. Um, yeah, all that, all that sort of stuff. People who can help. Bariatric units, if you've got a yeah. very large patient, you know, this that needs true. specialized equipment. So, yeah. We kind of yeah. broke it down to, what was it? The immediate urgent extrication. If it's an unsafe scene, you're just going to basically bug out, you know, grab them from the car, <laughs> burning car and run. Yeah. <laughs> And then we talked about the load and go, but, and as you said, it's not really load and go because you're doing stuff. It's expedited extrication. Mm -hmm. And then protection from the potentially adverse environments, hot, cold, rain, lightning. Right? Mm -hmm. um, requesting additional assistance. 
appropriate transport methods or bariatrics, air transport or whatever. And then starting to think about the appropriate destination too. Correct. Yeah. And, you know, this obviously, consideration. you've got choices in some places. So, you know, we could be talking about PCI for cardiac patients. So are we, if we're living in a small rural town, we might be taking everyone to the local hospital, you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Just depends Trauma on the bypass. situation there. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. a big one too. Uh, yeah. Neuro centers, talk yeah. centers, pediatrics. You know, yeah. if you've got a pediatric hospital and they've got something bizarre, yeah, let's mm. get you to the pediatric hospital because if we show up anywhere else, they're going to go, why didn't you go to, you know, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto? Like, why didn't you yeah. go to Sick Kids? So, yeah, Brisbane's yeah. the same. Brisbane's the same though, isn't it? You've got Marta yeah. and kids, women's and PA and yeah, very much, yeah. you know, specialized. It's actually probably way more complicated in the cities than it is in the country. Yeah, and that's part of our consideration as we go through mm -hmm. our extrication, it's part of our ease. Okay, Mark, so let's run through a scenario and see how okay. you go. All right, so, shall I be the student? Yes, I think you should be the, and I'm going to be the teacher. So, All right, and, uh, back on the can, hot seat. That's it, so you can, <laughs> you can trial out the primary survey on this patient. So let's sure. say that... Um, I have witnessed a, a, an elderly gentleman walking in the park. He's gone to sit down and he was sitting there for a little while and then he just slumps. He uh, sort of collapses and becomes unresponsive at that point. Okay. Uh, so I'll approach this like very uh, explicitly using the primary survey. And this is how our students do it when they're first starting so that you get an idea of, of how this whole thing works. All right. Mm -hmm. So I've got the call information. Um, I'm making sure I'm wearing my gloves and my goggles, that's safety. F, uh, we've arrived and I'm starting to approach the patient. Is there anything that I need to fear or need to be worried about as I'm approaching the patient? Is the scene safe? No, just my dog. Your dog, okay. I, Does I, your dog seem dog. aggressive? You're, okay, good, so we're, we're sure that that's okay. So I is gonna be the incident and uh, I've been told that he slumped basically atraumatically and mm -hmm. so I'm thinking probably a medical collapse of some sort. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was okay. just watching him. He just slumped and collapsed. Okay, R is number of patients. I'm taking a look and I just see the one male on the bench. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay, S is send for help. I don't really think I need to send for help right now, but I'll keep in mind that if I have to, I will. T is trauma to the C-spine, and I don't think he has any trauma to the C-spine based on the mechanism of injury, and since there's only one, I don't need to triage. So my general impression is an approximately 70-year-old male lying left, right lateral, which is it? Left. Left lateral on a bench, um, not responding to us as we approach. Yeah. I tried to um, poke him, but he didn't do anything. So. Okay. So this is the point where I actually approach the patient. I'm making sure that I, he jumps up. I'm still able to run away. And I say, hi, sir. My name's Mark. I'm a paramedic. How are you? Mm -hmm. Sir, can you open your eyes for me? Nothing? No, he just groans a little bit, like a little bit just like, mm. Groans to loud verbal? Yes, loud verbal. Okay, so I'm going to take my pen out of my pocket and squeeze it on the top of his thing and say, Sir, can you open your eyes for me? My name's Mark. I'm a paramedic. Can you open your eyes for me? So he's just, so, okay. He's, no, uh, he won't open his out. eyes, but he kind of just goes, does that when you try and squeeze his finger. Okay, so in my brain, I'm thinking moaning to loud verbal and purposeful movement to pain. That's my general impression of this guy and estimating his levels of awareness. And then uh, I'm just going to take a quick look at the patient and quick look around and make sure there's no immediate life threats to me, my partner, my team, or the patient. There's no catastrophic or life-threatening bleeding. Nice. None that I can see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, so now I'm going to switch from my safety first get over into my ABCDs. I'm going to check the airway, so I'm going to approach the patient closely. I'm going to feel for a radial as I'm doing this. I'm going to look at his chest, look, listen, and feel. Is the patient breathing? Does he have a patent airway? Uh, it, airway is patent. A little bit uh, noisy, like a little bit... A little stertorous? Yeah, just nothing major. Like You don't think it's, abstru it's actually obstructed, but he okay. does seem heavily... Uh, what's the word okay. for it? Out of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I'm worried about, it's tough when we're doing this in imagination, but if I'm worried mm -hmm. about that there is some obstructiveness, I might tilt him a little bit more. If not, if I think it's okay, I'll just leave it for now. There's when you tilt him, it, it clears it. It tilts it. When okay. you tilt him around, it clears it. You can just sort of pull him by the shoulders a bit. Yeah. 
get his face down. Okay, so that's airway. He's breathing. And what's my impression of his respiratory effort? Does it appear to be adequate? It's adequate. It's a bit slow, but it, it seemed, he seems very relaxed. Okay, that's good. Um, so I'm probably not too worried about his breathing right now in terms of correcting it. I'll ask my partner to slip an SpO2 on to see sort of what room air um, sats we're getting. Um, because of the stertorous airway, I'm going to keep in the back of my mind the idea of maybe putting an OPA or something in later if we adjust his position. But I'm not going to do any of that right now because there's still some other stuff I want to find out. So I'm going to, uh, I'm feeling for the radial pulse. Have I felt a radial? It's bounding. Like it's very it's, strong. Okay. And uh, tachycardic, bradycardic, normal? Normal. Normal. Okay. So I'm pretty happy with that in terms of circulation. I'll take a quick look at his skin. Does he look shocky? Does he look okay? Looks okay. Pink. Looks okay. Pink, warm. All right. Good. All right. I'm happy with that. Um, I, I could consider at this point the idea of putting on a cardiac monitor, but I don't think I'm going to just now because he's got really good ABCs and whatever's going on with his heart right now, I'm, I'm not terribly worried. So D is disabilities. I'm going to start thinking about bang zap push. So he's not seizing. He's not fighting me. I don't need any benzos. I don't see any signs of uh, anaphylaxis for adrenaline? No. No? Okay. Um, Narcan is a possibility. I'll keep it in the back of my mind. People have mm -hmm. different approaches to Narcan. I don't necessarily want to wake the person up, but if he wasn't breathing, I would mm -hmm. certainly be thinking about Narcan. Glucose mm -hmm. is an issue, but his skin is dry. Mm -hmm. So if he's hypoglycemic... You, you smell a bit of, like, maybe alcohol or something, though. You kind of, like... Okay. And that could be acetone. I don't want to get tunnel vision into. I'm always drunk. Mm -hmm. But all right. So um, I'll be checking sugar in a second. Mm -hmm. And since he's got a good bounding pulse, I'm probably not going to worry uh, at this point about getting a line in for fluid replacement. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's my bang. Would I need to zap him? My zapping would be defibrillating, which I won't because he's not dead. Um, he's not tachycardic. He's not bradycardic. So I'm not going to pace him. I'm not going to cardiovert him. That's my zap, and I don't think I need to push him right now. Um, I don't see any evidence of gross disability, like traumatic injury. No. no nothing like that? Okay. Um, and in terms of extrication, we walked in easily from the park. I'm assuming we've got our stretcher with us. It's going to be fairly easy to extricate him now. So I have the luxury of staying on scene and thinking, okay, I'm ready to do a more detailed assessment in a few seconds. But in terms of my... Safety first, get ABCDEs. I'm comfortable with where we're at. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. How's that, that sounds sound? really, Yeah, it's really good. It's very thorough. It's been a while since I did that. <laughs> now, it's interesting because we could make a different scenario. That one took a little while. We could do a different scenario where you walk into a patient's bedroom, and it's all safe, and you say, how are you doing today, ma'am? And she says, oh, I'm fine. I'm just having a little bit of back pain. I was thinking of going to the hospital. Well, my safety first, get ABCDEs is done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just done that fast right mm -hmm. she's talking she's responsive so although we've gone through a lot of detail in this and you know it's multiple items in order you can see how it scales mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if it's if it's a quick straightforward sort of patient you walk mm -hmm. in you say um my primary's done if it's yeah. a more complicated like that oh, guy on the bench just important to note, you know, some of the initial feedback we had was there was a couple of people who were like, oh, is this going to take forever? But this, yeah. these, you know, I think it was a hundred points of different bits and bobs that are in this. <laughs> yeah. Not everything needs to be followed, does it? You know, and, no. and like we said in our article, you know, we expect that, you know, most people who are practicing paramedics or who have experience are doing these things without even thinking about it. This is a design that we think is something that we can teach with and we can make stu make sure that students know that there is a sequence of priority of care for a patient, don't we? You know, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that they don't forget things along the way and, and that this does get uh, manipulated depending on the environment. You know, not everything is always going to be relevant. Right. It's a protocol. It's not a guideline. No, mm -hmm. it's the other way. It's a guideline. It's not a protocol. Yeah, that's You don't right. have to do this every single time. This it way. is a guideline in the sense that yeah. there's a lot of information in there that not not necessarily everything needs to be done. Yeah. It's the difference, yeah, that's isn't right. it? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's that old saying. I think I think we said this in the first podcast is that it's great to have a recipe, but there's 
there's no um, replacement for a thinking chef. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is a good recipe, and it's scalable if you're thinking about it. Mm. Um, but if you don't know what you're doing, you, this will just confuse you. If you do know what you're doing, this will help you. And mm. there's another metaphor that I use for the students because they say, do I have to say everything in order? It's like, no, as long as you get everything done, yeah, I'm happy with the fact that you did everything. And they say, you know, I don't think paramedics are actually thinking about this when they go on the road. And I say, no, they're not. They walk in and their spidey sense just tingles that something is wrong. They're not consciously thinking about this. But you have to learn how to consciously think about this first. And then you can let this go. It's like there's an old Buddhist metaphor of, you know, you build a raft to get across the river. But when you get across the river, you don't put the raft on your back. Mm. You, you've crossed the river. You've gotten to that point where this mm. becomes automatic, where it yeah. becomes almost reflexive of you walk in and go, something's wrong here. You know, mm. and just, mm, 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 or you walk in. I remember doing this with experienced paramedics. You walk in and you're going to, you know, I'm going to do a call and they're going to watch me. And then suddenly, boom, they're gone past me and they're taking pulses and they're doing stuff. And I'm like, what happened? We suddenly switched speed, but I have no idea why. It's because they walked in and went, oh, they're sick. No mm -hmm. time to play with this. They're really sick. I've got to mm. pay attention to this. And, and look, some of this is also, I guess, a good reminder that things do need to be broken down and not taken for granted, especially when it is an interesting or difficult case. So yeah. it, is, it is good something to fall back on, I think, for people who even are experienced that, you know, considerations that you – you may overlook, you know, to just always have that hanging. Well, let's go back to our ABCs, our, our primary survey. Let's step yeah. back a bit and make sure that we have actually done that before we move on. Right. Mm. Okay, everybody. Well, thanks for listening and staying tuned the whole way through. We're, we're at the end now. And I just want to um, thank everybody who's taken the time to listen to the second one. Really mm -hmm. excited to be here. It's been lots of fun so far. And you can still find us on Facebook and Twitter. And Mark, I think we've got a website coming. Is that right? Yeah, we've got the paramedicine.com website, which I've had since about 96. And I think it's about 10 years old right now, if you're going to go take a look at the beginning of September in 2018. But um, we have uh, people working on the website. Reese is working on the website. And we're hoping to have it. Yeah, our IT team. Uh, we're hoping to have the new site up. Uh, which will have lots of resources for the podcast and everything else by ideally end of September. This is all volunteer. So, you know, it mm -hmm. goes as fast as it goes, but hopefully by the end of September, we'll have the website up and ready to go. Sounds great. And mm -hmm. on there, we're going to even have scenarios that we can play on each other. We will. I think once we get the site up, we should probably do a show just sort of talking through the new website and the things that will be up there. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, well, right. thanks everyone. So keep on studying. Keep on caring. And keep safe out there.